Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we're ending up our second year of the Archaeology Cafe. I'm Bill Doley from uh, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're based in Tucson, but we work uh, all over the Southwest. We do preservation archaeology. One of the really fun and important things we do is, is public outreach. And this uh, Archaeology Cafe series we've been doing in Tucson for six years, uh, ending our, our uh, season here in, in Phoenix uh, at the end of two years. We will be back. So in the fall, we've got some new uh, folks here tonight. So let me just uh, give a little bit of an idea of uh, how this works. The, uh, general concept is of a science cafe and it's a getting together in an informal environment like this bringing people uh, in to have beer wine be, uh, drinks food and uh, in a really informal atmosphere bring specialists in to share their passion at, in terms of the research that they're doing uh, we focus on archaeology in our, our presentations and uh, tonight We've brought someone from Tucson. That's pretty far afield. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, concept of fields is a, a really important one in terms of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Jim Vint, I'm not sure how long I've known Jim, but it's been quite a while. Since last century. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Uh, Jim grew up in Tucson. He got his uh, BA in, in, at University of Arizona and took a master's degree up in, in Flagstaff and is now very, very, very close to completing a PhD in, uh, at the University of Arizona. And it's focused on the work that he did out at the site of Las Capas, uh, a remarkable site in the Tucson Basin. And I'll let you uh, hear it all from Jim at this point and uh, take us away, Jim. Okay. As Bill mentioned, in the last uh, 15 years or so, there's been a, just a tremendous uh, sea change in how we perceive and understand the early agricultural period in, in the greater Southwest. Um, and in that um, geographic region, I'm referring to uh, northern Sonora, northwestern Chihuahua, um, the west central and boot heel area of New Mexico, and then Arizona from the international border up onto the Colorado Plateau. And that also um, includes some fringes uh, into su very southern Nevada and parts of Utah and little bits of very southwestern Colorado. On the uh, map, that on the first page of the handout, it kind of shows you the, the general range of sites, uh, major sites that have been investigated in about the last uh, 20 uh, plus years. Um, in general, sites get younger as you go north. In the Tucson Basin area, uh, we do have dates, direct dates on maize as old as uh, 4,400 radiocarbon years before present, uh, which translates to about 2,900 to 3,000 BC. However, we don't have good context for those dates, but the dates are real. They are on identified maize kernels. Um, the earliest solid dates we have for maize in this region um, is about 2100 BC. Um, as you go north onto Colorado Plateau, um, the dates uh, at sites become slightly younger. Um, we have dates um, at Old Corn site uh, that are about 1200 BC, but as you get onto the Colorado Plateau, dates are more in the range of about 500 BC uh, to two or 300 BC. Um, however, that does not mean early maize um, did not occur up there. Um, there's uh, a very big, big difference in the way research has been done that is part of this sea change of our knowledge. For example, in the Tucson Basin alone, there are about 20 sites that we'd attribute to the early agricultural period. Um, up until about uh, the early 2000s, uh, there were about 20 sites in the greater area of southern Arizona dated to their early agricultural period. So why do we have as many sites in the Tucson Basin as we did in the, in 
southern Arizona and northern Chihuahua. Uh, would, would anybody want to hazard a guess on that? Construction is it's totally driven by, well, I shouldn't say totally, uh, but it's very heavily driven by cultural resource management legislation. And as part of the uh, major expansions of I-10 uh, and other public infrastructure in the Tucson Basin, it's allowed us to look in areas that otherwise would not be investigated. And in fact, um, some of these uh, early sites were found entirely by accident. Um, one of the sites that Jonathan Mabry uh, investigated in the mid-90s, for example, the site of Santa Cruz Bend, which dates to around uh, 800 to 500 BC, maybe up into the early AD hundreds, was in a right-of-way uh, area. No evidence of it at all on the surface, um, but we had a little bit of extra time and a backhoe. So uh, Jeff Clark had uh, the backhoe operator put in a couple trenches, and lo and behold, about uh, a meter to two meters below the surface, there were all these features. Um, and the dates came back as early agricultural period. This is an example of the way our approach to studying archaeology in this region has changed since cultural resource management really got into the mix. Um, up until the uh, early 1980s, even, uh, the Santa Cruz River in Tucson Basin was considered largely an empty, unoccupied niche until maybe the uh, AD 900s when the Hohokam really started establishing their presence in, in, the, in the Tucson Basin. Uh, Dave Doyle, who's not here tonight, remarked on this concept of the empty niche. Um, but turns out that it's not empty. It's just we weren't looking where these, these things were, and uh, we, the, th the sites just weren't visible. So um, I attribute a large part of the, the, this new knowledge to the ability for um, looking in places otherwise ignored. What I'll do tonight is I, I, I want to talk just generally about how I've been rethinking the way I look at, at agricultural practice in the, in the Southwest. Um, I'll be using examples from the site of Las Capas, uh, which dates from about 1200 BC to around AD, or excuse me, um, 700 to 750 BC uh, as the primary early agricultural component. That dates to the San Pedro phase of the late archaic, also called the early agricultural period. I'll be drawing in examples uh, from other disciplines, uh, in particular um, evolutionary biology, a, a new, or it's not, not new for evolutionary biology, it's new for archaeologists, we're always 20 years behind the time, but uh, the idea of niche construction theory, um, which basically means that uh, every organism in, in an environment has a ripple effect and creates mini and micro environments around it that affect everybody else. Um, so in the case of agriculture, canal irrigation agriculture, you can think of it as, as like a beaver pond uh, where that damming of water creates the margin around the, the lake that, that grows reeds and attracts bugs and, and brings in a lot of other animals and it becomes a very, very diverse local environment. That's exactly what um, traditional uh, non-industrial irrigation or uh, agricultural do, uh, agriculture does as well. Uh, when, when we see these fields, uh, you don't, I don't think of them as Iowa cornfields. It, it's, uh, it's more like my backyard after the monsoons, if we get the monsoons. Um, we have maize, uh, a, a lot of encouragement of amaranth and other weedies, uh, weedy annuals that grow in, in, well in disturbed soils. And uh, in addition to that, uh, it attracts uh, small animals, birds, uh, a moist environment that, that uh, leads to uh, actually st stabilizing the floodplain that it's on. So even though you're, you're irrigating the floodplain, you're not making it susceptible to damage by floods. Um, now, one of the uh, most exciting things that we found at Las Capas uh, were actual um, field cells within the canal system. Um, 
we knew that there were canals at the site from the work that we had done uh, there in the 90s, uh, but uh, we hadn't really got a good exposure of them horizontally. We had them in trenches. We were able to trace some out and begin to identify where uh, the head gates or intakes might have been. Uh, but other than knowing that there were canals, uh, we didn't really know what the field structure was like. Now, Las Capas is not the earliest canal irrigation uh, in southern Arizona. We do have canals as old as uh, 1500 BC. Las Capas, as I mentioned, dates to about 1200 BC to around 750 BC. So we know there was, there was irrigation farming on the floodplain for at least uh, two to three hundred years before Las Capas was settled. Once we uh, got uh, to the phase two excavations of, of, of this site, which is now, well, it's, it's on the, the Ina Road sewage plant uh, campus in, in Tucson near I-10 in and Ina. And uh, they, they basically doubled the size of the plant, which is, which is what allowed us to do this extensive work. Um, when we were exposing the areas, we were using backhoes, again, in stripping uh, they were seven foot blade and um, because we're in flood deposits it's very homogeneous and the, the uh, operators are able to to scrape very level and take off two to three centimeters of sediment at a time so it, it allows you to expose very cleanly broad areas and um, when we went into this like I mentioned we knew that we had canals but weren't thinking at all about fields. And we were standing there one morning, and the light was just coming up. It was just right. And we started seeing these light uh, berm patterns um, going at right angles, just completely opposite to what the floodplain should be. And uh, we started following them out, outlining them with, with spray paint, which is what you see in one of the photographs. But by the time all was said and done, um, if you look at, I think the map is on the third page of the of the handout, um, we had fields exposed uh, in, in about five acres of stripped area. Extrapolating that, um, we could estimate that a minimum of 15 acres could have been irrigated at this site using a simple ditch technology, perhaps as much as uh, 40 to 50 acres at its apogee. When you're thinking of the early agricultural period, it's pre-ceramic. People were still hunting and gathering. Why would they do this? Um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer. Reuven probably does. Um, but uh, regardless, um, early maize was not a fabulous plant, uh, the way we think of corn. Um, this maize uh, was a popcorn variety. and small. If you look at the second page, you can see kind of how it looks in the field. Um, if you're lucky and you, and you expose a piece, you get a, entire cobs, carbonized cobs, were maybe four centimeters maximum in length. Now when you consider that when uh, plant tissue like this burns, you'll get about 10 to 15 percent shrinkage. Uh, in length, in di diameter. So the, these uh, maize cobs were maybe five and a half, six centimeters in length. Um, number of rows, uh, anywhere from uh, eight to 14 rows of kernels, but very, very small. If you look at the page after that color photo of cobs, we have some uh, hand-drawn illustrations that Rob Chaccio did meticulously. Um, it's, not really to scale, but uh, the one you, you can see the one centimeter, uh, the centimeter marks on the right, on the left, and then the cob is blown up four or five hundred percent. Um, it, it it really illustrates how small and we would think maybe measly the, these maize plants were. I I think that that's a biased idea in many ways. We're holding on to this idea of agriculture being this, this jump into producing ever bigger and more productive seeds and plants. This maize stayed relatively unchanged for about a thousand years. Um, and maize is a very 
plastic plant. Very easily hybridized, very responsive to microenvironment. So why would people invest this labor in producing and growing these little ears of, of corn? You know, you might get six to eight ears per plant in his popcorn. Well, Jenny Adams and I got to th thinking about this and scratching her head. Jenny Adams is our ground stolen analyst at, at Desert. And I started diving into um, real science literature, not archaeology. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to use uh, maize plants. The stalks are very sweet, full of juice. Um, there are recipes from the 18th century uh, in New England and the Southeast for corn stock beer that, that settlers made. They would mash this stuff and ferment it. It's basically like sugarcane. Popcorn is very hard to grind. The uh, grinding technology at this time was primarily flat metates that could not contain flour very well. This stuff is miserable to try to grind when it's dry. We, we've tried it. We've tried grinding it parched. We've tried grinding it simply dried. It doesn't work well. You're better off popping the kernels and grinding it into flour after it's popped and make something like a tole. But when you harvest it green, it is super sweet. Um, the, the bricks, I, I have a little, being a brewer, I, I have a, a bricks uh, measurement instrument. Um, this green corn, we grew chapalote, which is a, a Mexican land race that's a popcorn. It's not a good analog for this prehistoric stuff. We don't have a good analog for prehistoric uh, popcorn maize, but this is pretty, as close as we can get. When we harvested these uh, green chapalote ears, it measured as sweet as super sweet hybrid corn from uh, the Midwest, recent strains. Um, now that sugar converts very quickly into starch, um, but uh, it's very easy to process. If you take these green cobs and rub them on a matate, you get masa instantly. And we, we, we ground this stuff up and made little cakes and fried it. It's delicious. Uh, you can make tamales, you can make cakes. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to use these maize plants than what you, we think of in terms of of uh, say Puebloan agriculture where they're growing flower corns um, and even uh, uh, some of the early uh, maturing uh, maize land races in this region. So when we say early agriculture, we shouldn't think simple or primitive. It was the happening thing then. I mean, it was a great, it was modern for them. It wasn't early agriculture. So it's, it's a wonderful complement to what they were already hunting and gathering. Uh, these irrigated field systems create little microenvironments that provide additional greens, attract animals, seasonal bird flights, and uh, you get uh, a complete suite of, of what you need in uh, terms of plants. Um, they're still hunting. Uh, at Las Capas, we're, we're dominated by uh, uh, rabbits um, and some uh, medium-sized game. But maize and amaranth, uh, mesquites, uh, make up uh, the predominant plant foodstuffs. Uh, now, what, what would any of you think of when you hear southwestern agriculture? You have, you have corn. OK. Uh, <laughs> corn, beans, and squash. And why is that good? You get all the amino acids, uh, amino acids complementary. Um, which allows you to not have to rely so much on, on animal protein. Um, so early agricultural period, squash does not show up here until maybe eight or 900 BC at the earliest. Beans don't show up until Reuven, uh, around AD 100, I think, 100, 200, Kathy, somewhere in there. Um, so we've got about a, uh, over a thousand years of people deliberately growing maize and incorporating it into their diet without the other two sisters. Amaranth. Amaranth grows like pigweed. It grows like weed. It's pigweed. Um, it's very nutritious, very easy to harvest. You can eat it as greens, quilotes. Uh, you can eat the green seeds and you can eat the dry seeds popped as a tole. 
Amaranth provides the same amino acids in ratios needed to complete the, the protein profile that beans and squash do. So even though maize was not the bulk of the diet, although it, people were becoming um, more accepting of it, um, maybe as a seed, in addition to eating the greens, um, but uh, they already had that complete plant package. So the adoption of these um, central Mexican agricultural um, pillars wasn't really necessary here. Once the investment was made uh, in really becoming sedentary and um, population growth uh, and change uh, through time, which is a black box right now for some things, but uh, they could get away with, with just growing maize and amaranth and other greens. Now, are any of you gardeners? What do you like to grow in the southwestern deserts here in the spring and winter <laughs> besides flowers? Uh, peppers, peppers um, onions, greens, garlic, things that, that aren't really frost tender uh, other than the peppers. Uh, so another thing that got me uh, thinking about what's different in the early agricultural period is um, growing season. We use proxies to estimate seasonality in archaeology sites uh, with, with different kinds of plant uh, macrobotanical remains and pollen identified in, in archaeological sites. But that's dependent on when those plants set fruit and when they're blooming. So you're measuring only those things. You're not measuring other aspects of those plants' life cycle. Right now, I have greens growing in my yard that have been going since uh, October. Um, granted, this is an unusual year, but uh, there's no reason that people couldn't be cultivating and encouraging these, these greens that can pop up in the early spring and go into the fall to complement what's being grown during the warmer months. And unfortunately, or frustratingly, it's, it's difficult to identify that kind of, of extended season growing because these greens don't leave the same kind of archaeological signature as, as the mature fruits and flowering elements of plants do. So we'll leave it to young ethnobotanists like Reuven here to uh, come up with ways to see this in the future. One other way we've been able to look at what's happening in these fields uh, in the early agricultural period is the use of phytoliths. Anybody know it? That's the nickel word of the day, phytoliths. All right, it's the silica cast of, of certain plant cells. And they can be very diagnostic. And usually they're diagnostic of the fruiting uh, part of plants. Uh, maize, uh, cobs, and, and, and cupules have very distinctive forms. Um, different seeds uh, of plants have very distinctive forms. In the uh, field sediments from Las Capas, uh, we submitted uh, a number of samples for phytolith analysis. And one of the common uh, phytoliths we found was uh, something that is very similar to little barley. Now, little barley is a cool season grass that generally grows at, at slightly higher altitudes at cooler climates, but it's undisputed in, in these fields in this low desert. How could that be? Well, irrigation just doesn't have to happen in, in the uh, warm months of the year. Um, based on analysis of little aquatic critters that we found in, in the canal sediments, ostracods and freshwater mollusks, there is a complete life cycle of these, these little animals from birth through mature to death. Um, our analyst, Manuel Palacios Fest, estimates that this indicates uh, a minimum of eight to nine months of water in the canals at Las Capas. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be flowing 24 hours a day, but it's water there standing and pooling and flowing through enough for these, these animals to live. They're indicative of temperature and water conditions. Uh, many of these prefer cooler water and clean water, which um, we got from the Santa Cruz River. Um, so pieces of evidence like that can 
allow us to start making inferences of, but of what else was being grown in these, in these early fields. I think that these fields were probably being irrigated for nine or ten months out of the year. Um, my backyard, the, the hose is the analog for these canals. If you put water on things in the desert, it's going to grow as long as you don't get a freeze. So I think we're starting to get uh, evidence now that's allowing us to say that these weren't just itinerant early farmers playing with a new technology. We're starting to see people tethering to the landscape, investing in uh, canal uh, irrigation systems, and making a commitment to place and a lifestyle change. Um, and by lifestyle change, I'm talking about moving from groups who were relatively mobile, as modeled or inferred for the Middle Archaic, where people were tracking animals in seasonal rounds, to, to now having your own little mosaic garden in an ideal pristine place on the Santa Cruz River. And we've got sites like this up and down the Santa Cruz. Um, we just don't have a good window into them like we do at, at Las Capas right now. So I'm hoping that more sewage plants get built uh, so that we can open up some of these other sites. But, okay, uh, what do you folks think might happen when people settle down and build this kind of infrastructure? What, what's going on on the social landscape? Certainly more, more time to invest in building and enriching your, your local environment. Uh, you're not trucking around all the time, but people up the river are doing it. People down river are doing it. Um, at Las Capas, we estimate that the village size was around uh, 80 to 90 people at any given time, including infants and adults and, and elderly. That's a pretty sizable community, um, and you're irrigating. My analogy for looking at these communities is uh, modern uh, New Mexico acequia organizations. Uh, has anybody seen how, the, how these operate? Um, they're a, a beautiful example of a social organizing system that's flexible and requires input from everybody and cooperation from everybody, but no one person gets to take over without everybody getting upset. Now, th these canals, um, you can see they're pretty extensive across that site. The, the, uh, the Las Capas uh, area is within about 120 acres. The main ditches, um, from what we've been able to uh, measure from exposed profiles, the main ditches are about a meter and a half in diameter and about 75 to 50 centimeters in depth. Based on the cross sections, that allowed for a uh, functional water depth of being able to deliver water through the system of about 35 to 40 centimeters. Those then parse into smaller distribution canals, which then break off into uh, smaller canals yet that go into these gridded field systems, which I illustrate on a, a couple of those pages. Now, if you're living there year-round, you're digging this stuff, you need labor. You don't need a whole lot of labor, though. Uh, these field systems, uh, these field cells that you see in the aerial photograph, average about four by six meters in, in dimension. Um, how long do you think it would take somebody to dig one of those with a mesquite digging stick? Half a day? 45 minutes? Kathy says 45 minutes. Oh, Darby says 45 minutes. 28 minutes, based, based, on, based on us. Well, based on my young employees. Um, uh, Fred Niles and I dug one out at a combined age of about 120 years um, in uh, about 30 minutes. And all it entails is scraping a shallow bit of dirt on either side of where you want that berm to be and pile that dirt up. Uh, one, when you irrigate that field, that water is going to consolidate it. I had uh, some young strapping people dig one of these by themselves in anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes. 
you can translate that volume of dirt moved to canal construction. Um, with two people, you could dig about, based on our estimates, is it doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> um, it, after all, it was late June in Tucson. Um, but uh, you could dig about four to six meters of, of large canal uh, in half a day with two people. Yes? We're in no caliche. We're on the floodplain. We're 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 in this blessed blessed soft silt, um, sandy silt. Um, so we have that going for us. Uh, not like up here. <laughs> um, so we're lucky. Um, but uh, anyway, when you when you start playing numbers games, you can get a system like this built to a functional level and then extended as you need it. Uh, over time. Uh, I've played some numbers games with this and uh, you could have the entire extent of our largest documented extent dug with a labor pool of about 50 people in less than three months. So it's easy to do, relatively speaking, but it's also an investment. So how do you keep this working? This is where looking at the acequia uh, communities comes in, in my thinking. I, I have some pictures of acequias. They're, they're dirt, unlined canals, about the same sizes as the ones that we've documented at Las Capas. I've found several really cool studies on uh, communities in northern New Mexico that have a labor pool. Well, each year, the Mayordomo, or the leader, or the organizer of these labor parties, um, brings people together to, to clean the ditches, landowners, uh, farmers who um, use the main acequia. Everybody's responsible for maintaining a certain length of ditch. Um, I've found several communities that irrigate about the same area as Las Capas. And the yearly cleaning out of their main ditch and distribution ditches uh, with a labor pool of about 40, to pe 40 people or so, using metal shovels, but it's not soft silt, uh, can clear out the length of these main canals in a day or a weekend at most. Um, so the maintenance is, is, is needs to be organized, um, but um, it can be done efficiently. Now, what happens when people get together and work? When they're done working? <laughs> yeah. yeah um, and, and people who have been interviewed in these communities, you know, they have kids who have left and gone to L.A. or to Albuquerque, um, but they come back each year because this is their community. Um, they have people who don't even live in this community, but from down, downstream or upstream, they come in and volunteer to help. It, it forms social bonds. Uh, it allows, you know, politics to be resolved. Uh, it allows improvements to be made. Uh, it's a very, very strong social glue. And I think the more that we look at early ag communities in the Tucson Basin and elsewhere, we can probably start playing with some cool models about how these communities work together. Uh, who's upstream? Who's getting the most reliable flow of water? Why are some communities located here? Um, what happens, um, this is where computer simulation comes in nicely, because then you can change numbers and change water flow and so forth. But what happens if the community up here is diverting water when somebody downstream wants to use it? And these water rights are, are a major thing today, uh, even, even here. Colorado, southern Colorado, San Luis Valley. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's heart and soul of, the, of, of communities. So to kind of convolutedly come around to the end, um, I show some pictures of folks, uh, you know, digging out those canals. Um, and I think of early agriculture not as early agriculture. I think of it as, as community. I think of it as um, a time when social and political organization was changing more significantly than subsistence. I'll just stop it there and uh, uh, open up for questions. I, I didn't talk about a lot of things. I didn't talk a lot about uh, sediments, what we see in sediments, or architecture, or, or, or stuff, uh, points, uh, things like that. So 
if anybody has questions, uh, uh, please feel free. On the picture that has the modern canal mm -hmm. and your canal, on that uh, archaic canal, I've seen those kind of pictures from our Hohokam out at our Mesa Riverview and so on out there by um, Mesa Mound also. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does this really compare? I, I kind of looking at this forget about what the Hohokam canals look like in depth and in width. Okay, these, these are puny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have some colleagues who derisively call them ditches. And yeah, they're ditches, uh, yeah, but they're very functional ditches. They're, they're the arteries. Um, the whole Com Canal's completely different story. I mean, yeah, you, you, Kathy can ta tell you more about them, but, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, those, those are several meters wide, several meters deep, and run for kilometers, tens of kilometers. That they did look puny. I would not say mm -hmm. that, but in comparison to what I remember, but that wouldn't do anything but make the model that you're talking about, the community that they can support, only be a different size than ours along the Salt River. Uh, it, it doesn't indicate puny. It would just support a different size. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And communities here um, really take off at around, I'm going to step uh, in a hole here, but ar around uh, about yeah, 700 to 850 AD, uh, you start seeing very, very large sites uh, like Snake Town grew where you have thousands of houses um, and, and very long-term occupation depth. So, yeah. Um, I have a question that is, goes back to where, when you were talking about growing the chapalote. Mm -hmm. And that you'd pick it green and grind it. Yes. Grind it then because it's easier. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the, that whole uh, nixtamalization and, you know, getting out all the whatever it is, niacin and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, I... I I mean, I know you're talking about archaeology, not food science, but I didn't know if you guys had done any testing to see sort of at a green stage, is that nice and available, uh, you know, and how does that work in with the amaranth? And I'm kind of glad you mentioned Chapalote because I have some <laughs> too, and it's really great stuff. Yes, it is. And so is the amaranth. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, no, we did not have the wherewithal to do any chemical analyses on this. Uh, I would love to. Um, uh, the way we were able to, to sneak that part in was we have a wonderful volunteer up in Oro Valley who is uh, uh, recreating traditional uh, native gardens through the centuries. And so she's been kind enough to grow out lots of chapalote and other stuff for us. So um, it, it was kind of a bonus for us. But I would, I would love to do that down the road. Um, but that's a whole dissertation. <laughs> oh, I just have one. Of, were, were there any other besides... Um, maize and, and amaranth, were you guys finding anything else that sort of seemed to be either a staple or a, let's say, a, a, a tended weed? Yeah, well? uh, we, we get a, a fair number of uh, plants in the sunflower family, uh, goosefoot, um, and then uh, we also have uh, a number of things that are probably brought in almost certainly by irrigation water, but we have things like uh, uh, net leaf hackberry, uh, seed coats, um, and, and other things. So um, the, the, what we're seeing in the phytoliths complements, it doesn't really replace uh, traditional pollen or macrobotanical analysis, but it's allowing us to see things uh, that we don't get in those more uh, traditionally used uh, studies. So that, that's part of my thinking and uh, forming this argument that, that these fields were being used to grow for a much longer period of time than just the assumed warm months of the year. Is there a difference in the rate of the river flow compared to the valley? Do you get washouts like we've gotten here? Yes, um, that, that's a very good point. Now, where Las Capas is located, it's just below the confluence of two uh, mid-sized streams that come through the Tucson Basin, the, the Rito Creek and Cañada del Oro. Um, that does a couple things. Um, first, where those debouch into the Santa Cruz River Channel, it creates a gravel mound, which uh, allows the water table to be high. 
um, higher than else, elsewhere in the, in the, you know, along that stretch of the ri river. Um, uh, Paleoecological studies have, have documented a large uh, wetland, Cienega, uh, in that area. So we know that that area was always wet, that it almost certainly had perennial flow, except in major, major drought. Um, and that's specifically for the location of Las Capas. Now, uh, most of the flood events were relatively minor at Las Capas. Uh, and in part, that's also because the uh, uh, CDO and Rieto, uh, where they can go in, if the Santa Cruz is in flood, almost always the CDO and Rieto are going to be in flood. When those two debouch into the Santa Cruz, it pushes the main stream flow against the west bank of, of the Santa Cruz River, um, which protects the area, the floodplain area of Las Capas, which is on the east bank of the river. So it has a certain amount of natural protec protection. But it's also very vulnerable. Does anybody remember the 1983 floods in Tucson? Um, that deposited um, a very distinctive orange sand uh, across parts of, of, the, uh, of the floodplain there that, that were visible after that flood. Now, in the, the cross section here, where I compare the Las Capas Canal to the, the modern Asequia, if you look in, in, the, in those profile faces, you can see an orange sand that caps and laps into the canal. That sand is exactly the same sand that was deposited in the 1983 floods. It derives from Cañada del Oro, and this was a major flood, um, 800 BC, uh, October 10th at about 4 p.m., um, <laughs> that uh, covered the entire site. And that's basically what ended uh, the main early agricultural occupation at Las Capas. Uh, we don't know where the intake was for this canal system due to modern construction and, and riverbed change, uh, but uh, it's almost certain based on behavior of modern floods like the 1983 flood that this would have channelized the river, which lowers the water table and probably blew out much of the uh, intake of, of the main canal, rendering it basically useless. Um, now, there were attempts that we've documented in sediments above that flood horizon at, at re-establishing re the, the canal system, but they weren't very effective, and, and ma major habitation in that area declined. Uh, we don't know if they moved upstream or downstream, uh, but that particular area um, at around 800 to 750 BC, um, due to that major flood, um, was no longer uh, very suitable for irrigation agriculture. Uh, early on, you had these very small uh, ears of popcorn. Now, is there a certain period of a certain time where much larger ears are produced by, say, plants coming from maybe Mexico that would maybe cause uh, more concentration on growing corn and less on other side crops? Um, that's, that's a good question, but uh, it's interesting uh, that uh, maize is about the same size throughout from the heartland of Mexico up to here until you get to around time of Christ, early AD hundreds, uh, where new land races have been developed that are larger, but that, I think, is coming into play because communities who have made these commitments to the land are now able to experiment more and hybridize these plants, get more out of them, and, and that's when you start seeing the increase in size. So they're not necessarily coming up from Mexico or anything? Right, right. Locally? And, yeah. And it, there's some, um, oh, I, sh I should remember the name of the website, but uh, there are right now documented, in currently being grown um, in northern Sonora, uh, primarily in some here, about 140 land races of maize. Um, and they range in size from, you know, maybe eight centimeters to things that are, you know, look like that, you know, the wonderful Iowa flower corn. So it's a very, like I, I think I mentioned earlier, it's very plastic uh, and very easily hybridized and can, changes can be made over the course of a couple years. Um, in the 19-teens, for example, University of Arizona agriculture labs were trying to incorporate or to, to grow uh, Midwestern flower corn out here. 
it's just too hot and dry. It wasn't doing well. So um, they hybridized it with, with uh, Tohono O'odham flower corn, and within three years had a hybridized plant that was growing uh, ears of corn this long that, that uh, were stable in, in reproduction and, and drought tolerant. So uh, change can happen really qu quickly, and it's at a resolution that we really frustratingly don't have in archaeological measurement. In the uh, <clears throat> Sequia communities of uh, New Mexico, do they practice crop rotation, and is there any evidence that these early farmers would have known about that and practiced it? That, that's a great point. Uh, yes, the Asequias, uh, they, they, they do crop rotation, uh, particularly for fields used for um, uh, browse, alfalfa, and, and annual plants. The orchards, they basically leave alone. Uh, and then they usually have some fields left for grazing. But uh, one thing with the Las Capas example, where we have these, these cells, um, the elegant thing about this design is that allows you to very efficiently use small amounts of water to irrigate an area completely. Um, if you were to try to irrigate this room with you know, a canal intake that comes from here, it's going to take a long time to get to the other end. You're going to have a lot of infiltration and loss here. But if you divide this up into little cells, you can take it here, irrigate the cell on this side, the cell on this side, open that up, bring it down, open, open. And if you have a real low flow of, of water in the river, you can choose to irrigate only a portion of your, of your irrigation system. Or if you're working on, uh, with my idea of early and late season planting and growing, you can dedicate some areas of your field system to those crops while you let others either lay fallow or be remodeled or you know, otherwise stagger your planting so that you can harvest things in a, in a rotating manner. So it's a very flexible and, and beautiful system. I will go to the back. Uh, while I'm walking to the back, is there evidence of uh, storage of, of the maize crops? Ah, now, that's, that's another thing that I think people aren't thinking broadly enough about. Um, one thing that you do see when early agriculture kicks in is, along with increased sedentism, we get large storage pits, big bell-shaped pits. Uh, I've got a picture with five of my crew members sitting in one. Um, but it's not the best way to store things. The Food and Agriculture Organization of, of the UN has done some wonderful studies in uh, the Sahel region of, of Africa and other um, areas of the north and south of the equatorial line. And um, there are communities in West Africa who, who are dependent on millet, uh, similar analogous to amaranth, maybe some of these popcorns. Um, they use both pit storage and above grain silos. Food stored in the pits, seeds, um, they line these pits and then cap them. You can keep food in there for up to a year, but within a couple months, that atmosphere in the pit becomes anaerobic because of the decay, which destroys the viability of the seeds. And within about six months, you have about anywhere from 40 to 70% loss of product due to rot and mold. So if you're storing for food, that's a kind of a last ditch effort and you'd probably be wanting to do um, um, storing of, of something like mesquite or something that's, that's uh, abundant, easily gathered and put in. Whereas for maize, um, it, it's probably best stored in above ground containers. In this case, since it's pre-pottery, uh, they're probably wicker granaries, basket uh, type things. Um, but Again, that's something that we don't get to see easily in the archaeological record unless you have a dry cave or something like that. Um, Jim, I had a couple quick questions, and maybe I missed the first one. Has there been anything similar to this kind of early agriculture um, site, these things we found along the Santa Cruz, have there been similar findings up here in the Phoenix Valley? Or are we still looking for that? Or is the salt and Gila just not the right river? Or um, still looking. Uh, very different ge ge geomorphic settings uh -huh. and also a different mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, Reuven, again, I'm going to keep picking on you. Um, Reuven uh, spent about a year and a half uh, with me out on, in the field at Les Coppice and on the ride up. And uh, 
Uh, he's recently been working for the GRIC, the Gila River Indian Community, uh, working on excavating uh, primarily classic period Hoacom sites. Well, in one of the backhoe trenches, people kept walking by this burned feature, and Reuben kept poking them, saying, hey, that looks like an early egg house. Hey, that looks like an early egg house. And um, they got, they let them put a unit in, strip around it, early egg house, pits around the outside, just like what we have down here. So uh, it, it, this alludes to what I mentioned earlier of shaking that, that mindset that we've had since the 70s of places being empty until the Hoacom or somebody else came along, and also being able to work in areas that, that otherwise wouldn't be worked in due to cultural resources legislation. Even in Iowa today, they have to dry the corn and keep um, evacuating the air f mm -hmm. to keep the corn from doing rotting. Yeah, uh, the, the temperature and dryness is, is a really important factor. And I, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but if you don't get the grain down to uh, somewhere between, I think it's like 5 and 8% moisture, um, your rate of spoilage goes up logarithmically. Um, it's, it, you know, it's the bad, one bad apple. I'll keep it easy, I promise. <laughs> All right. um, now, so my question is, um, as simply put, like, what was the limiting factor? Um, they had solved the collective action problem of getting, getting these canals built. They had the crops. They had water. Um, why didn't it get big like the Hoacom did a couple thousand years later? Regional population, uh, regional networking, uh, marriage patterns, uh, and the gro growth rate of population in general in the region. Um, I. I couldn't give you offhand population estimates for this time period, but much, 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 much lower than uh, even early ho ho com. So we're talking about um, people with a lower reproduction rate um, uh, and longer and more difficult ways of getting together and integrating these small communities. Uh oh, here comes Reuben. Uh oh. <laughs> So um, this idea of cool season domestication, or cool, growing cool season plants, sorry, not mm -hmm. domestication, um, specifically little barley, why would it be that we don't have uh, evidence of little barley domestication until, I'd say, about 2,000 years later, similar with uh, amaranth in the Hoacom region? Mm -hmm. um, if these folks were focusing their energy during cool season months on, say, something like little barley. Why, why wouldn't we have domestication taking place? Why don't we have evidence of that domestication? Um, that's a question I can't answer. Um, my ignorant approach to, to domestication is to, uh, especially with these, these advantageous, advantageous weedy things, is that they grow very well in disturbed soil. They don't need a lot of encouragement. They don't need a lot of tending. Um, so if you're growing things uh, or letting them grow in, say, fallow fields or fields that you're letting rest uh, from main maize or more intensive growing, uh, that maybe there's not that much manipulation and selection for those plants. Uh, I really don't know anything about the productivity of little barley in terms of seed um, production. Um, but uh, I would think that since agriculture, although I, I said it was modern at the time, not early, uh, but uh, uh, it's at a time where maybe they're not experimenting so much with, with all of the plants. I, I, that's kind of a cheap answer. So I'll... I'll back up and say, I don't know. Would it also be possible that because they were smaller, they could take advantage of the terrain locally? Because you've got some really good grasslands in the Tucson Basin. And you can go to the Catalinas, you can go to the other mountains in there, and you can get small game. Maybe they didn't want to spend the time, and it may just have been a supplemental thing rather than their whole lifestyle being based on it. And in, t and in Phoenix area, the Holocom people pretty much uh, wiped out the lo local game and gathering because there were so many of them. Mm -hmm. Would it have some, anything to do with that? Um, a little bit. I, I don't think the population pressure and demand for animal protein was as great 
there are some indications of, of local vegetation shift in what that does to the frequency of rabbit populations. Uh, there's a uh, jackrabbits, for example, like wide open, open spaces where they can see and run and get away from the bad guy, whereas uh, cottontails like really brushy areas. So uh, you can look at impacts of agriculture denuding the land and m making changes in that kind of, of way to local animal frequencies. But uh, I think that these, these little gardens were more of a, a lush mosaic than a big monocropping kind of thing. So I think it would be much more diverse. Uh, similarly, the, the rate of uh, large mammal uh, remains remains fairly constant through time until you get up into uh, the, the formative or ceramic uh, period uh, around AD 50, 150, which is also when you start getting population increases and heavier pressure on, on the commons. Back to the weedy grass, the weedy plants. Mm -hmm. Not such a cheap answer. I mean, I still harvest um, dandelions, and I would right. never think of starting to plant dandelions in right. my garden, yeah. you know? Yeah. So if they're yeah. available, why yeah. should I exactly. worry yeah. about it and yeah. put, in, you know, put um, effort into it? Right. Yeah, and, and if you can encourage those things to grow more densely, then, then it might occur out you know, in the undisturbed land, all for it, yeah. When does cotton make its way into Ooh. Arizona? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there have been reported instances of single grains of cotton pollen in early agricultural sites. But uh, that's like a sample number of three from three sites, and uh, the uh, the integrity of the context and identification, therefore, is kind of, eh. uh, we do have definite cotton uh, in the Tucson Basin, I think by the, is it Agua Caliente phase? Somewhere in, in the AD 200 to 400 range. Oh, uh, Kath, Kathy, Kathy comments that, uh, they, that here in, in the Phoenix area, uh, they've, they, they have cotton at about the same time period during what's the Red Mountain phase up here of around 200 AD. When everyone was talking about weed versus plant, cultivated plant, and I was looking back, and, and you'd start off talking about sort of, the, I, think, I think you called it niche environment theory. Niche um, construction, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've heard that recently from um, uh, Native Seed Search, Bill mm -hmm. McDormand, I was talking about exploiting that native, or that, that um, niche environment to increase diversity, and, and, and I was just wondering if you could expound upon that just a little bit, maybe how you tie those concepts into what you interpret what you're seeing. Okay, I'll fall back again on a modern analog. Uh, there are um, fields uh, in northern Sonora uh, that are a bit larger than these, but um, the main field area that's irrigated is, is used for growing the maize or chiles or other things. Uh, whereas on the berms and along the canals, Reeds are allowed to grow, plants that are used as medicinals, wild tobacco, other things like that. And then, um, again, the opportunistic weeds that like um, the disturbed soil. And so by digging and maintaining these canals, bringing water into an area that's usually not wet increases the, the vibrancy of, of that floodplain or irrigated area. You know, technical terms like multifunctional agriculture have been thrown around. but. Uh, Basically, it's enhancing. It's enhancing that local environment in a healthy way. It's not like modern monoculture. So you're, you're building little environments and everybody affects each other and is affected by others in, in, that, in, in that, that landscape. Jim, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.